Welcome to another episode of Real Christianity. Today we are talking about what is a biblical woman part two. Part two, mm-hmm. we did part one last week, and so uh, before we dive in, Veronica is going to start with us. Uh, but I wanted to tell you, if you haven't left a review, we would appreciate that. We remind everybody every episode because the reviews, the way that the algorithms work in uh, iTunes and I guess, releasing or allowing more people to see that our show exists is one of the metrics is reviews. And we do have, um, I think, 2,400 reviews now, which is incredible. But again, if you guys haven't left a review, would you please do the, do so on iTunes? All you have to do is just swipe up and tap the stars. It's super easy. You don't even need to write anything. Um, also, again, you can always listen to this show on YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, Spotify, uh, or iTunes. And uh, this is a video, so if you're listening to it, you can watch these as a video. We have many couples that do so. And we'd love to uh, have you over at YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Um, But let's dive in. So we have some great content. Part two, catch us up. All right, so what is a biblical woman part two? So if you haven't yet, go ahead and go back and listen to last week's episode, uh, to part one of this series, before listening to this episode, because there we open up with... um, We open up that episode with the context of why we're doing this series um, and some of the theology behind how we're viewing these passages. Um, And then next week, we're going to be doing a two-part series on what it means to be a biblical man. So uh, ladies, just as the men should listen to the biblical woman episodes, you should also listen to the biblical manhood episodes um, because it's good for both men and women to know. Um, Yeah, to know what the Bible says about gender roles and responsibilities. Yeah, and we did this. I mean, you you watched, uh, Paul Washer did a fantastic series on Mm -hmm. biblical manhood, and you enjoyed that, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we sat in bed and watched a three-part YouTube series. Because not only is it it, kind of give you more clarity on your own role to be walking out, but if you have children, Mm -hmm. it it gives you some clarity on where to be guiding them as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're you're a, a mother of boys. Um, it gives you a perspective of what manhood really is and should be. Uh, if you're the father of daughters or you have a wife, uh, then you have the perspective of what the Bible prescribes a woman to be. So, um, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention that I did mention in the first episode, but mentioning again, just for super clear context, is that we are not talking about the descriptions of what a woman is in the Old Testament. We are talking about the doctrines of what a woman is called to be in the New Testament. And it's really easy for us to want to leverage the descriptions of a certain woman uh, historically, like the Proverbs 31 woman or Ruth or um, Esther, Esther, or Deborah, mm-hmm. uh, but in reality, that's different than the doctrines of what womanhood is to be according to the new covenant, which supersedes the Old Testament in terms of its, uh, I guess, how we're supposed to be obedient to God's word. And so that's what we're talking about today. We have a variety of scriptures that we're going to go through. Um, last week, we touched on three or four scriptures, and then this week, we're going to touch on three scriptures, too. Yep. So we're going to cover um, three passages today, and we're going to start with some background theology on what it means for a woman to be a helper to her husband. So in Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Yeah, this is a pretty popular passage of scripture. I think every time you talk about marriage, this passage comes up. Uh, I don't think a lot of people talk about it as much as they used to. Um, I don't think that churches are talking about marriage or roles or gender roles really much at all anymore because it can be so offensive to a culture today. Uh, But I think that uh, there's some clarity that needs to be happening on what this means. And so um, a lot of Christians think that this idea of the head and helper. This is like the theology word that they call it in like seminary. It would be called the the head and helper or head plus helper structure that God ordained here in the Garden of Eden, but also reinforces later in the New Testament in Ephesians 5, uh, 1 Peter 3, and so on. Um, But a lot of Christians think that this idea, the structure of of Adam and Eve's head and helper is some like patriarchal structure of the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. and it's only because of the fall of man and sin. Um, In a perfect world without sin, God would not have made a woman the helper. 
but instead offer her an equal role uh, with with man. Um, so this is actually just some uh, tragic situation that happened, the way that it's played out, and we need to kind of rectify it in a modern world. That's that's kind of a way that this could be taken. Um, but I'm actually here to tell you that that's, that's actually not a good way to look at the scriptures because if you look back at the book of Genesis, you'll see that God actually set up the headship and helper structure or the headship and submission structure and the roles for husband and wife prior to sin entering into the world. Um, Genesis 3 is the fall of man, and this is Genesis 2. So this is what I'm saying here is that in a perfect, sinless world— God still designed marriage to be head and helper Mm -hmm. or in the roles uh, of headship and submission without sin. Like perfect world, no sin at all. God still designed it that way. Now, equal in value, uh, different in role, um, both bearing the image of God and valued again identically before the cross. This isn't a value conversation. This is a role and responsibility conversation. Um, and the word in the King James Version uh, is help meet. Um, there's New King James might say like a helper. Uh, I looked up the Hebrew today and I was spending some time studying it. Uh, it's pretty fascinating. It, it actually means a helper like his opposite, uh, comparable to him, like his opposite. Um, not his inferior helper, but his opposite. Again, we're talking about what, you know, I think I mentioned this last episode that God created complementary pairs, you know, heaven and earth, um, you know, uh, land and sea, moon and sun, man and woman. Th- these are not duplicated sameness, but they're actually complementary. They're equally valuable. They're all critical, uh, but they're different in their role. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so the word helper also is actually the same word that God uses in the scriptures to uh, describe the Holy Spirit as the helper. And so the helper cannot mean inferior, because if you look at the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is not inferior, uh, but equal, just different role and different responsibility. So, Yeah, over the years I've heard a lot of women say that just because a woman is a helper doesn't mean that her husband is above her. And yes, that's true. He's not above you, but he's actually in front of you. Mm -hmm. Um, So we even see this played out in the Garden of Eden. um, And I'll go ahead and let you explain that. Yeah, so in the Garden of Eden, this idea that people, I I think, uh, they try to escape the reality that Adam is actually the head, um, even though that we don't, it doesn't necessarily say the head versus helper structure, uh, but it definitely implies it if you read the text. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple points. And again, this will all wrap up here at the end, but I think it's important. And it's important for the ladies so that you can actually be confident that this is the role that God designed you for as a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been like this since the beginning of time. So in, in the creation order, man was created before woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's unique. If if woman were equal in role, uh, why didn't God create man and woman simultaneously? Uh, so it's just something to to ask yourself. This is actually the idea of precedence, uh, the firstborn, and this firstborn concept actually continues to go on throughout the entire uh, Old Testament and New Testament. But Jesus is actually the firstborn physically, but also the firstborn and first raised of the dead. And, and so there's some really interesting themes of precedence that we don't have time for. But uh, point number two is that we can also see that Adam was uh, the leader or the head uh, by the authority that God gave Adam to name woman. And so he gave Adam this role. And it's funny because this, the, like the force of that argument is actually still felt today. Many women resist male leadership um, by not taking their husband's name at marriage. Mm-hmm. And so this is still an issue of not letting their wives or not letting their husbands uh, name them in a capacity. I mean, obviously different than we're talking about in the Garden of Eden, but taking their last name. And so it's another way to kind of show that I'm, I'm actually not going to uh, fall in line uh, or be submissive or uh, identify as one with you. Um, <clears throat> number three, in the Garden of Eden, we can see that God um, creating Eve for man. And so he actually 
creates Eve for man. He doesn't create man for woman. This is actually expressed again later in the New Testament just as an argument. Um, But uh, he also creates Eve as man's helper. And there's no current institution throughout history where the helper is the leader or in an equal capacity of, of role. The helper is always the helper. And so again, God, uh, you know, um, creates Eve uh, for, uh, uh, for Adam and also identifies her as helper. And that is kind of an important identity as a woman to just realize if you could just embrace this stuff. And I know Veronica is going to touch on that. Um, And then the the fourth thing is that we can see that God actually gives Adam and not Eve the instructions and rules of the garden, Um, you know, of what trees to eat from and what trees to not eat from. These are like the rules of morality that God has given Adam in this specific moment. And um, if it were complete equality, as many people like to argue, God would have instructed them together instead of entrusting the rules of morality to Adam. So those are some really quick points of just, I guess, illuminating that this has been this way since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and none of this is to make um, us women feel less than. It's simply to help us rest in the role that God has created for us, that mm-hmm. his, God has made us to be. Um, and culture is fighting so hard to make women feel that God's design is inferior mm-hmm. and that they should not be seeking to help their husband and they should not be submitting or not staying at home, not getting married um, and not becoming mothers. And society is under this pursuit um, Society being under this pursuit has actually not improved. It's only gotten worse. Yeah, it's totally gotten worse. I mean, we're, we're not seeing like an improving strength of the family. We're not seeing like the the more the metrics of morality improving in culture today. Um, mm-hmm. And and I, I think what you said here is that that it's simply to help women rest in the role that God made for them. I think a lot of women. I think at least for me, when I finally accepted that is that is how God called me. It actually brought me a lot of peace. Yeah. You don't have to like, yes, guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or try to fight to be, uh, approved in so many other different capacities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I just think it's a beautiful thing. What, what I want to take away for the, for the men here is that husbands, it's not a sin or God's antiquated design that, you know, this old like patriarchy is terrible. Like there's a lot of, that's a loaded word, patriarchy, but in terms of just uh, male leadership of the family, um, husbandry, true biblical husbandry, um, it's not a sin. God has actually given you the position to assume loving headship uh, in relationship to your wife. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, it's actually God's perfect design for you. This is where you are to be. And we're going to talk about that to the men next week about what that actually looks like. Um, but this, again, for the ladies, is um, God's perfect for design for you as a wife. Um, and it's a good thing to be a helper. And I think, as Veronica said, just, just sitting in that gives you peace. Just going, oh, I'm, I'm made to help my husband fulfill the work that the Lord has given to him and us because we are one, Mm -hmm. but he's going to lead that out. Um, And I think it's just an important perspective to yield to, and it gives a lot of peace to embrace it. Yeah, embrace Mm -hmm. it. That's the word I was looking for. Um, So the next scripture we're going to go through, scripture number two, is going to be found in Ephesians chapter five, verse 22 through 24. And uh, I'll read it here for you. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, is also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So this doctrine is is not just um, reinforced by Paul, but it's also reinforced by Peter yeah, in and chapter this is, three. Yeah, this is the doctrine of submission. So we're we're hitting mm-hmm. that um, that part. I guess the idea is that we talked about helper. Now we're talking about submission. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's all it's actually in um, the book of Peter as well. Yep. In chapter three um, of his first epistle. And I'll go ahead and read that for you too. 
Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Um, so yeah, it's an unpopular idea in the culture and even in the church um, yeah. to be a submissive wife. Um, but Dale's going to break down the idea of submission for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to break this down. Uh, again, you know, I'm not trying to come at this with my opinion. Uh, I'm just trying to explain what I think the scriptures are teaching. And you get to um, determine and evaluate what that means in your life. Uh, you know, I didn't write it. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like sometimes I'd go, man, I would have probably wrote that differently. But God's practices reinforce God's purposes. I've learned that over and over again. Uh, the culture pushes against uh, mm-hmm. pretty much, um, I've learned this. If it's unpopular in the culture, it's probably right with God. Um, that's generally uh, the, that's how, the how, how it's worked out for us. Yeah, that's how it's worked out for us. If it's if it's the hard thing is usually the right thing. The unpopular thing is usually the right thing. And and so um, the first note that is um, that we're going to talk about is this is submitting to your own husbands, mm-hmm. um, ladies. You don't need to submit to every man. Um, this is submitting to your own husbands. That's what the scriptures are teaching. I would say if you're an unmarried woman, an unmarried adult woman even, and you're the daughter of a father who follows Christ, uh, that I would say just through my understanding of the scriptures that you would it would be a godly thing to be in submission to your father. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you don't have a godly father, then you would be uh, fall under what I think the scriptures do teach is that you would be in submission to your elders or your pastor even at, at church. Um, and so that's another topic, but I wanted to answer that question because a lot of people are going, I'm not married. You know, who, who am I? Am I just a free agent? Um, I, I, you, we all have our own independent relationships with Christ, but um, I think that God's design is that, yeah, you should be, um, as a woman, um, uh, you know, all the men are in submission to Christ, which we'll talk about, but all the women uh, should be in submission to their fathers, uh, their husbands, or or their... Uh, the, spiritual uh, leaders. Spiritual leaders, yeah, mm-hmm. in, in the church, um, which again is sometimes hard today. But um, so yeah, Paul doesn't just say this. <laughs> Peter says this. So if we want to do theological gymnastics, you got to get around Paul and you got to get around Peter. And this is pretty impossible in terms of when you look at the scriptures themselves. Um Paul and Peter tell wives to submit to their own husbands, but they also command husbands in both of these letters and throughout the rest of the scriptures to submit to Christ. So just remember that the husbands aren't free agents either. They're submitting to Christ, and they're also called to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which is a big deal because the way that Christ loved his church is that he died for her. Um, He gave himself up. He displayed his headship for his wife, by dying for her, uh, sacrificing his own desires in order to make a, the path to salvation easy. Um, and so, again, we'll hit this with, with the men next week. Um, the, the idea here, the theological idea that I guess we, we've put together as a society or as a church is called derived authority or subsequent submission. Um, and I, I want to explain that. Ultimately, ladies, you're following your husband who's following Christ, and Christ is following God the Father. This is uh, also displayed in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it says that the head of uh, Christ is, is uh, or it says that the head of every woman is man, uh, is her husband. Um, the head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. Um, and that's the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, so this is, again, and I know the scariest thing for a woman uh, is to follow a husband who's, or be in submission to a husband who's not in submission to Christ. That's a terrifying thing. Um, but this is what the scripture, these are letters to Christians, I will say that. And uh, there's a call for the Christian husband and there's a call for the Christian wife. Um, and it for the woman, it is uh, submission to her husband. Um, I'm going to say this another way. Um, ladies should not be viewing submission as uh, forced subordination. That, that's not what this is. Like Christ isn't here to put women like in some undervalued forced subordination position. Um, instead, he's here to say, 
what he's desiring is willing participation to be under one mission with your husband. And I really like that definition of submission is to, to be under one mission. Um, and you are one flesh as a husband and wife, mm-hmm. and you're willing to fall in line in the leadership structure that ends with God the Father at the top. Mm-hmm. And so you're not an independent entity, an autonomous woman. No, you're, you're going, I want to actually be in line with under one mission, with God the Father, with Christ, with my husband, and with me. And that's really, I think, a healthier way to look at, at submission. Yeah, and just to add another thing, um, something I wanted to point out is that for the ladies is you're not submitting to your husband because your husband tells you to. You're submitting to your husband because God says to. Yeah. And it's an honor to follow God in this way. Um, and then, so moving on, that's just a, a quick point I wanted to make. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about in this episode is modesty. Um, and the Bible calls women to present themselves modestly. So we're going to go ahead and look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. And I will go ahead and read it now. In like manner also, the women... Uh, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or or gold pearls or costly clothing. Girled pearls. (laughs) But but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. You did pretty good there. And I have braided hair right now. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that. Um, No, it's it's good. Um, This is a... uh, you know, again, so our, our structure today is really helper, um, submission, submission and, modesty. and modesty. Yeah. So we're going to, we'll, we'll close with this little section here. Um, this actually, th- this, this specific passage in first Timothy chapter two, um, if you would turn to that in like your new King James vi- Bible, um, it, it would actually say men and women in the church, um, uh, above this section. So it's, uh, the, the the scholars that put together Bibles have recognized, as well as me, have recognized um, this is talking about how to conduct yourself at church. Um, and I just think that the theme of modesty is throughout the entire Old Testament, New Testament. And I think we can look at how we should conduct ourselves at church and should apply that. We don't have to, but we should apply that probably into like how we dress all the time. And there's plenty of other sections in scripture that talk about modesty that I just didn't choose because I thought this one was uh, easy to go through. Uh, But it is specifically directing towards how you should dress at church. But if you're one of these people that goes, oh, I'm going to dress this way at church, but I'm not going to dress this way anywhere else, um, there's maybe a heart issue with with this. Um, The first command in this passage in uh, 1 Timothy uh, 2.9 is to adorn yourself in modest apparel. Um, in other words, you should be looking or not looking to advertise. And I think that uh, we live in the yoga pant church place, you know, like where people are wearing yoga pants and stuff to church now. Um, and like we're from Southern California, you'd go to church and people would be wearing like crop tops at church with yoga pants. And like, you're like, this is crazy talk. We have our friends that that uh, are in our church that just came from San Diego. And and yeah, you know, the culture is more naked in general. And so just the things that they accept at church is just amazing these days. Um, and it's something that we, we need to really start paying attention to. Um, you, you shouldn't be looking to cause eyes to come toward your body, like the, the, getting the eyes of men to directed. To draw attraction. Yeah, to draw attraction to your body. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a biblical woman uses her clothing to draw attention to her face um, in terms of just framing her face. And I think that's something that that uh, is like a lost art for many women in culture today. It's really all about accentuating and creating sensuality. It's not about eloquence. It's not about um, uh, being an elegant woman or a proper woman or just a modest woman. Classy. Classy, yeah. All those words. Yeah, it's it's about sensuality Mm -hmm. and the right to do so and just that kind of aggressive tone of like, I'm going to dress, it's, you know, like, I'm not going to change me. You just don't look at me, like Mm -hmm. that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. We actually did an entire episode on this, and I know this is probably actually part of your notes, babe, but... (laughs) 
But you're still in my notes. I'm still in your lines here. Um, I'll bring it back up. She'll later. bring it back up. Yeah. Um, moderation. So it says with moderation and propriety. I want to talk about moderation. Means the avoidance of excess or extreme. Like, be moderate in the way that you decorate yourself is what it's saying. Like, don't be extravagant. That's not a Christian woman thing to do. Uh, and if you live in the South and you go to these big churches, like you absolutely know what extravagant church wear is. And it has nothing to do with the Bible mm -hmm. and actually is spoken against. Um, propriety is, is what is kind of viewed as correct in the culture that you live in. I think it gives you a little bit of freedom here of, you know what, like some of the modesty guidelines are different in Iraq as they are in America. And they're gonna be different in Hawaii than they are in, you know, Washington state. And so um, I think it gives you a little bit of freedom, but I also think that it still calls for modesty wherever you're, you're living. Mm -hmm. um, when it says not with braided hair, or costly clothing. Um, some people take this absolutely literally, um, and I'm actually a literalist in terms of a lot of scripture. Uh, I actually think when you look at the context, you, you really study this and you understand Paul's other doctrines on these things, that I think Paul's attempting to get his point across, a principle across, and he's using an example. Um, and I think what he's saying is don't make yourself the center of attention and don't flaunt your wealth, um, especially at church. Yeah, it's a, distra a distraction from the ministry that the Lord and the Holy Spirit wants to take place in the meeting. Yeah, what's the heart behind it? Is, to, is it to show off and flaunt what you have and how your beauty? No, I think it, instead it should be a heart of going, hey, you know, you don't want to stand out. Be pretty. Dress up in terms of just take care of yourself. I, I don't think this is saying like be like plain Jane every day of your life. I think it still gives um, allowance it, to which that. Which it's okay if you're plain Jane every day of your life. Yeah, Veronica. I'm just kidding. Veronica wears like jeans and a t-shirt most every days. single day. That's her perfect, <laughs> Pretty much. perfect jeans setup. Um, but it says instead, do what is proper for godly women who have good works. Like do what they do. Look up to these older women who are classy and elegant and eloquent and do what they do. And not just the godly women who say they're godly, but the ones that actually are clothed in good works. And it's evidence uh, that they are actually following the Lord. Uh, faith that works is dead in terms of um, the works that you see in some of these women's lives are the evidence that they actually love God. And um, that's how we'll, we'll know. Um, and I think he's saying... Look at godly women and live like them, uh, and, and also in in the way that you dress and learn from them and learn from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, I think here's the problem in the modesty conversation: Christians are instead of looking to Scripture, are looking to other Christians to determine what's appropriate to wear instead of going to the Bible and mm -hmm. determining what's appropriate to wear. Like we don't necessarily get to go and just create what is and is not modest based off of what everybody else does. You, you get to look at scripture and you get to look at Christ's call for how we should live in all areas as the authoritative factor um, and not just kind of create a, a what is it, a grading on a curve, <laughs> you know, where you're looking at someone else to, to find your position. Yeah, the Bible doesn't tell us to look at what the church is doing to gauge our morality. It tells us to look at Christ and his word to gauge our morality. Yeah. Um, so I think to wrap this up, it's important for us ladies to realize that our choice of clothing um, is not disconnected from, to our, from our faith, um, meaning clothing has a lot to do with morality and holiness. Yeah. Yeah, I think about like sacredness. The word sacred means connected to God. And we, we just assume as a culture that the way we dress has nothing to do with our faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important that you made that point. Yeah. And then lastly, again, what you just said, like, let's not forget the purpose of our clothing is for what we're trying to cover and not what we're trying to reveal. Um, what you're trying to cover up is your sexuality mm -hmm. and yours, ours, you know, women. Um, and our sexuality is only for one person, and that's your spouse of the of the opposite sex. Yeah. Um, and if you want to learn more about modesty, 
taking Dale's note back that he tried to steal from me. Yep. Um, we did an entire episode on this topic, and I believe it's episode 12. Yes. Um, and it's one of our more popular podcasts. So go ahead and give that one a listen as well. And again, listen to part one of this episode if you haven't. Yes. Well. Yeah, give you a lot of context here. Um, and so I think that that's a good way to end in terms of just concluding the conversation. We did, I think, part one, part two, I think covers a good chunk of ground of what it means to be a biblical woman. Um, and, you know, again, Christian, if you say what it means to be a Christian woman, um, uh, it's pretty easy to interpret that of what the church is doing. But when you say biblical, you go, oh, I want to look at what Scripture says mm -hmm. and walk that out. And so uh, that will be the end of our part two of the what is a biblical woman. And we and are... Next week, we'll have part one of what is a biblical man. Yeah, and it's I'm excited for this. Um, I'm going to actually do some more studying. I think these things are going to be watched and listened to for, you know... It's funny, we were just watching a video from Elizabeth... Um, Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot was from, what, 1989? It was the year I was born, so yes, 1989. And I thought, <laughs> wow, these... I was like, man, this video is, like, being made is... I was being born. Yeah, and you think about that and you go, she had no idea that this video was going to be watched like 30 years later. Oh, and it's got thousands and thousands of views on it as well. Yeah. And then you look at what she's wearing and you're like, man, for 1989, that is a classy, modest woman right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I just go, we don't know how this could be being viewed 30, 40 years from today. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, we're excited to talk about what the Bible says about womanhood and manhood. Um, hopefully this was edifying to you guys and helpful. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you guys are regular listeners of the Real Christianity podcast, would you go and leave a review? Uh, just um, tap the stars. And if you write something, um, guys, for those of you that are writing things, I'm reading them and I'm like... Dale reads them. <laughs> I'm so humbled every time you guys give us a, a, a review and, and even some honest feedback, which is actually really helpful as the well. the only time I read a review is like if somebody writes me directly or something. Yeah. Not that I'm against the reviews. I, I actually just get nervous. <laughs> I feel more pressure on, more pressure in <laughs> knowing like the numbers of how many people listen to the episode. It makes me more nervous. So it's it's actually better for me not to know. Well, it's pretty, yeah. If there's like a really awesome one, you'll share with me. Yeah, and so I, uh, one, one thing I'd like to also ask you guys to do, um, this show's been around, we've got, yeah, this is episode number 36. Obviously, prior to uh, episode 30, um, it was called Ultimate Marriage, if you're new here. Um, but we'd also ask you to refer the show to a friend um, that is maybe struggling with their faith or uh, is looking to deepen their faith. Lots of people already do this, but I'm just going to ask you directly if you have a friend that you can think of mm -hmm. that would benefit from going through this podcast um, content with uh, with them. Uh, we'd love to have them, and uh, it seems to continue to be edifying for many people in the church. So on that note, we will see you guys next week on our first episode of Biblical Manhood. Thank you very much. See ya. See you guys. <laughs>